Eso. So the quiz asks for, please redraw the plot um, with the activation energy for the forward catalyzed reaction. You can either share or square, depending on how you interpreted that originally. Um, and then the products for the catalyzed reaction and the transition state for the uncatalyzed. So these are like, yeah, there's basically a bunch of pairs you could choose from. So like, this is the place to make the mistake and realize you gotta pause, slow down, do whatever it is you gotta do to organize, you know, mapping it for yourself. Because this is, you, you lose like, Couple of points on one quiz, not a problem. We're going to drop a quiz anyway by the end of the semester. Like, you, you make this up. But then you got yourself organized for the exam, which is when you really need those points. Forward catalyzed reaction. Please label products for the catalyzed reaction. So that's three. Uh, so we'll do this again in our usual distribution. Uh, you can circle it, you can point to it, whatever you want. Products for, I mean, I asked for the products for the catalyzed reaction. The products are the same for catalyzed or uncatalyzed, but as specified. That's there. And then transition state for the uncatalyzed. And again, you can circle or point however you like. Transition state for uncatalyzed. Questions, thoughts? Right on. Okay, very good. We continue. We're starting a new chapter today, a new section equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium. Capital K, not rate constant, lower. Capital K, equilibrium constant. Today we're going to practice defining the equilibrium constant. I seem to have used a different font for this slide, and I guess it's okay. We're going to define the equilibrium constant in two ways manipulate multiple equilibrium constants. Start poking at Le Chatelier's principle, my favorite principle. And then we'll see if we get to defining something called Q, reaction quotient. But first, where are we? Every day, I wake up and I ask myself, what the hell are we doing today? And I have to look at, at all the schedules that are posted up at my desk and say, am I supposed to do anything really important that I forgot about today? What is today's date? We're on the 8th, right? Yeah. Okay, quiz, did that, yes. Are we going to start equilibrium? Yes. I don't think we're going to get to ice tables. That's probably next time. But that's okay. Today, then Wednesday, then Friday, then exam one. Yep. It's in here. It's 85 minutes, the usual class length. Um, you should bring a calculator that does logs and exponents. Um, you should bring something to write with. You can use pen, pencil, whatever you like. I'm totally agnostic to that. Um, and I guess that's Oh, and bring ID. And it can be either student ID, driver's license, whatever. Because I've met a lot of you, but I don't know all of you yet. So we'll check IDs. Check IDs when you can to me. Is that it? I'll bring everything else you need. Um, the 
you get your stuff done. Study hall last Friday, pretty successful. People were over there getting some stuff done. Um, some people working on the sapling, making progress on that, on the ones they were stuck on. Some people working on lab reports and all that kind of stuff. That's good. Um, oh, yeah, so sapling. When is the kinetic sapling homework due? Today. Yeah? Today? Sunday at 6. What are, anyway, well, it's due when it's due, whatever it says online. When are the, if you have to fix it, because you used up all your six attempts and you're like, man, it's just a formatting issue. I know I understand this. Or you get one that you used it up, but then you figured it out. How are you going to get the point back? Yeah, write, the, write down the correct way to do it. Give a little one sentence, here's what went wrong. Or here's what I know now. And submit it to the yellow folder outside my office within a week of the original due date. Um, that, if you look at, I learned the way the grades are calculated. The problem sets for homework, it is a little bit funky. It looks like there's two grades for each homework. That's because I put in one for imported from Sapling, if you got your outer ID correct in Sapling, which you should do, um, and another for the resubmit. So if you got 100, I just give you a zero for the resubmit, and it takes the higher grade, and you go from there. Uh, but that's what the two grades are. One is for the resubmit. And if you don't want it, or you don't need it, don't worry about it. Yeah. Should we go? Should we start equilibrium? Yes. No, let's not do it yet. There's always something more to do before we actually do work. Let's talk about jobs a little more. Do we do this yet? Do we do any job searching in this class? I don't know. The semesters are blending together for me. I've done this many times. Maybe, maybe not. Um, there are lots of job search websites. Um, what is good or bad, depending on how you want to think about it, is that now they kind of are all the same because now they all search each other and include those jobs. So it's, there used to be ones that were better. Now they're actually not that different. I actually think that's okay. Um, I like Indeed because of the way it does regional searches. So if living in a particular area or a particular commuting distance is important to you as it was to me, I like that. Glassdoor. No one heard of Glassdoor? Yeah. It's, a, I assume, a joke on the glass ceiling, which is a thing you can look up. I don't know if I know that. But it is one of very few places you can search for salaries, what you will make in a place doing a particular job type. Not perfect, there's a lot that aren't there, but it's something, because otherwise it's really hard to find out how much you might make doing a thing for a company. Let's try one. You want to look for jobs or salaries? Salaries. Nobody ever wants to look for jobs. They always want to look for salaries. I have like five YouTube semesters of people saying salaries with no hesitation. I would, I would say the same thing. Glass door. Find the job that fits your life. Okay. Jobs, companies, salaries, interviews. Never done interviews. I don't know what that is. Let's look for salaries. All right, where do you want to live? The bigger metropolitan area you, you pick, the more stuff we will see. Where do you want to live? Where? New York. New York. New York. What you want to do? Oh. Veterinarian. Veterinarian. Now, this is interesting because they're autocomplete. So we'll look at veterinarian, and then we'll go back and see the like, oh, well, vet school didn't work out, but I still love working with those animals. Let's see the other ways I could do that. Veterinarian in New York City. Average base pay, 100K. Additional cash compensation under the table. What? Uh, I don't know what this is. Uh... Okay, so the range is from 73 to 133. Um, and then there are a couple of comparisons here. You can say veterinary technician. I mean, you could, you, I don't know if you live in Manhattan on that money, but in the outer boroughs of Staten Island, perhaps. Um, maybe that school is worth all those loans for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I don't know. You can do the math yourself. But what's important about this to me is that it enables you to actually do the math. If vet school will tell you how much vet school costs. They may or may not tell you how long it will take you to pay off those loans. This will let you do that now. Do the math. Work doing the math. Uh, okay. Let's do an Indeed search just for fun. What chapter did we just finish? Uh, 12. 12, but, it, but what's the topic? Kinetics. Kinetics. Where do you want to do kinetics? San Diego. People will be like, John, I don't want to do kinetics. But San Diego is good because there's a lot of biotech in that area. 
Senior scientist, biochemistry. Hey, that's almost the same as a veterinarian makes. Okay. Senior scientist is a PhD level position, by the way. They don't tell you, I don't know why they don't tell you that, but that's what that means. Uh, patient care, quality control chemist two, 65 to 75. Scientist one, Omniohm, that's a good name for a company. General Atomics, very good name for a company. Lots of jobs. Two pages worth of jobs that include the word kinetics. 115 people were like, oh, shoot, that was relevant, actually. What we just spent two weeks on. Anyway, these are my two favorite sites. I love, actually, now this has some of the salaries as well. Um, it's really nice, because they, they always advise you to go into interviews and, and negotiations. Understand what you should ask for and how much you're worth. How are you supposed to know that? They don't tell you. Now the internet can help you. Do the math, know how much you're worth. Sweet. Um, if you're running through these in this semester, or frankly, later, um, I still have people come back to me and be like, John, remember that thing you showed me? Could you help me with that? Totally cool. Very happy to help you navigate these. So come back and find us. Okay. Questions about finding jobs and then getting paid? Rock and roll. Check plus. Equilibrium constant, K. Capital K. You may also see K E Q. K is the equilibrium constant. K E Q is the equilibrium constant. Why do you need the letters EQ? I don't know. But you might see it. And that's what it means. It means what you already knew, that it's at equilibrium. <coughs> you might also see KC. The C is for concentration, because that's how we calculate it. Um, there's also Kp, which is pressures. Um, I don't do those. My view is that probably 99% of the 115 of you all are going to do solution phase science rather than gas phase, rather than like atmospheric chemistry. And then if you shift gears and go into atmospheric chemistry, you can probably learn this and you'd be all right. So I have elected not to do the pressure version. Um, if you need it, you can look it up in budget. So we stick with the concentrations. What does it equal? The mantra for this chapter, and I think I counted last time, and I think it's five chapters out of this whole course deal with equilibrium. Your mantra is products over reactants, products over reactants, products over reactants. And you use concentrations in molar, moles per liter. And you use coefficients from the balanced equation. As exponents. That is
Here's an equation. It's not balanced yet. Let's balance it. Is this an example problem? Is this an example problem? Yeah, sure. Please balance this equation and give the expression for the equilibrium constant. Sure, sure. What do I need? Mm. If I do two and two, does that work? That works, right? Now I got two carbons, four oxygens, four oxygens. K is products over reactants with coefficients as exponents. CO2, that's the product. Coefficient of two became an exponent of two. <coughs> O2 had a coefficient of 1, so it gets an exponent of 1, which is not written. <coughs> Balanced equation, products over reactants. That is the, those are the two steps. And those are the two steps that will start quite a few problems for the older questions, the whole rest of the semester. We will do more practice. So what values, these are concentrations. The values that actually go in there, like if I measure a concentration of CO2, measure a concentration of CO, measure a concentration of O2, at equilibrium, when the system is in balance, I can plug those concentrations in and calculate a value. You know, Algebraic, arithmetic. Now we'll get a value for K. What can I conclude if the value is big? A large number. It's a big reaction. Well, I wouldn't say it's a big reaction, but you know something about the products versus the reactants. Which do I have more of, or which are more stable, or something like that? Yeah, if K is big, I have more products. I have a big numerator. I have more products than I have reactants. <laughs> products got in there enumerated. Like a verb kind of thing. Is enumerate a verb? Sure. If not, what does the numerator do? It gets divided. That's not giving it very much agency. I'm just here to be divided. Just a numerator. <laughs> what if it would? Uh, okay. What if the equilibrium? <laughs> this is going well. What if the what if the equilibrium constant is small? You have more reactants than you have products. Yeah, the, then the denominator is big. It's here to denominate, to do the dividing. Uh, that's the one that has all the agency, all the power, the denominator. We should take, this should be in like a math GE class. Right, Riley's like a good I am, but not for that. Come on. That's actually illegal. How does the numerator feel about its role? All right. Uh, that's all I want to say on that slide. Questions so far? Products of reactants, coefficients as exponents. Then look at the fraction and see what's big and what's small. Yeah. So that example we just did, that would be a uh, small equal 
equilibrium rate? Ah, with that, with the example we did, V, a good example of a small equilibrium constant, you don't have enough information yet. I've given you neither the value for the equilibrium constant nor the concentrations to calculate it. So maybe, but you don't know yet. But that's exactly the type of question you would then go answer with that, with that strategy. Good. What else about equilibrium constant? The book will go on at length about something called dynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium is balance. But dynamic is the word they use as opposed to static. So static is staying the same. I have the concentrations I have, but they're not changing. Nothing is moving. Dynamic indicates movement. Reactants are turning into products. Products are turning into reactants. But if the overall concentrations are changing, what do we say about the rates? They're also changing? I would say they're equal. If the forward rate becoming products is equal to the backward rate becoming reactants, I have no net change. So then what's dynamic equilibrium? Dynamic equilibrium means that not only are these rates the same, they are not zero. If it were static, these rates would be zero and nothing would be changing at all. Here they're changing, but they're changing at the same rate. So at any time you look, you see the concentrations, you will get the same value. We already used this. We used this in that rate determining step thing that we did with the slow and the fast. We said the step that was at equilibrium, the one that the fast one before the slow one, we could write rate forward equals rate back. Set them equal to each other, and then solve for some stuff. The old, I actually forget what the new textbook uses as an example. The old one used uh, migration as an example. That is, if people are moving into a city and out of the city at the same rate, you will find the same population of the city anytime you look. That type of thing. What about rate constants? We can derive this, and it's actually kind of neat, but I'm not going to do it here. The equilibrium constant is the ratio of the rate constants. And this still equals products over reactants. Is it more about the rate constants? What about it? Capital K's and lowercase k's. K1 is K forward? Yeah, exactly. So K1 is K is the forward reaction, the rate constant for the forward reaction, and K minus 1, as it's pronounced, is the rate constant for the back reaction. Yep. Good. Cruising through, cruising through equilibrium. One more thing, uh, one more of these slides where he writes a bunch of stuff. Then we can actually do something. Maybe we care about ocean acidification? A couple people do. Most people don't, that's okay. No, I'm just playing. Um, this is one of the most pertinent reactions for that, which is the dissolving of K2. 
calcium carbonate, um, which is a structural building block for many marine organisms, corals, shell builders, so on. I'm not going to include the calcium carbonate solid. So what do we leave out of products and reactants? I'll put one down. Solids. Why? For like phases. Yeah, the fa exactly. We're looking at the phases here. Um, so the, sh the, the upfront answer is solids and liquids. We're not going to include, but let's talk about solid first. I can measure the concentration of aqueous calcium 2 plus. I say, well, I'm under visitors in solution. I can do the same for carbonate. If I put shells at the bottom of my beaker, what is the molarity of them? I, I don't know. Yeah, make up a number. Because you can't really measure it. If something isn't dissolved, you can't measure a concentration for it. And the way it's mathematically treated is you say, well, it's one. Which to me is kind of unsatisfying, but at least it works the same way every time. So it's consistent. You say, as long as there's a solid there, I don't really care how much it can dissolve. Like, to a point, that works. Functionally, you leave it out of products over reactants. Mathematically, it becomes one. So it's the, that divided by one, and we just usually don't write it. Pure liquids. Hydrogen fluoride, a chemical you must never use because it's extremely toxic. Actually, you can't use it, it's dangerous. Uh, reacts with water to form hydronium, H2O plus, and fluoride. What's K? Uh, H2O plus. Yeah, I got H2O plus, so I do products over reactants. That's a product, it's aqueous, so I do include it. Coefficient is one, so exponent is one. Then? Yep, fluoride. Um, and so these get multiplied, fluoride. And then? And then over HF. And then over HF. Water or no? Uh, no? No. Right, it's a pure liquid. It has a liquid phase, not an aqueous phase. So we don't include it. Solids don't have a concentration. Liquids, the reason is a little bit different. You use a parameter called activity. Instead of concentration. And the activity, which is these, I think they're called braces. Um, I've been drawing these for a couple of years now, and you can see I'm getting better, but I'm still not good. This is why I work with bracket. I work with concentration because I could draw the brackets. For any pure substance, but for pure water in this case, the activity is 1, 1. 1.000000. So it goes into products of reactants, but it goes in at the number one. So we mathematically leave it out. So what do I mean by activity? That's an awesome question. Um, technically, the products of reactants are all supposed to be in activities. Activities are really, really hard to measure, whereas concentrations are typically to measure. So we use concentration as a, as a stand-in, as a proxy for activity. Um, the activity, I define activity as how much of the material do you have relative to that pure material. So pure water, okay, we can, I can get pure water, I can study that. 
if I have impure water, I can say, well, I have 98% pure water, my activity is 0.98. Um, it's basically a fraction of how much of my material is, is pure of that chemical. That's something we address a lot more in my 400 level chem class, which you should take, it's way easier than this one, believe it or not. Um, yeah, activity is like the, the, for me, one of the deepest rabbit holes in chemistry that you can get down in and get stuck real deep. Um, if you're curious about more about what it means and how you calculate it, um, for example, my lab has a water activity meter, um, which we use for chemistry, but actually um, so the manual, it's usually used for food science. So you're reading the manual for this chemical instrument, and it's talking about, you know, pure water is your calibration sample. And then it says, if your sample is a muffin with chocolate chips, and you're like, wait, what? Because it's used for food safety as much as anything else. Um, we have something that can measure water activity. So if you're curious, come see us. We'll show you. It's pretty cool. Bottom line, leave solids and liquids out. Everything okay? <coughs> hang, on, hang on one moment. Okay, leave solids and liquids out of products over reactants. And then the why, you know, here's the first pass of why. If you're curious, I'm happy to talk about it, but there's, that's enough to go on for now. All right, we're going to do some stuff. So let's get this balanced equation written down, and let's do products over reactants for it as written. Let's do products over reactants for K. Is it balanced? I think so. Yeah. It's got a bunch of set up. Evidently, the tea bag I used to make tea was not uh, structurally intact. <laughs> Products over reactants for this balanced equation. I see if there are any solids or liquids. Nope. Okay, so I don't have to leave anything out. I can just do regular products of reactants, HCOOH. Um, that's formic acid. If you've ever been bitten by one of those biting ants that stings, that's what they sting you or bite you with, that chemical. HCOOH? Yeah, HCOOH. Hurts. Stings. Products of reactants, no problem. You ever do Hess's Law? Yes. Yeah. Me, me too. Right on. Um, sometimes when you're doing Hess's Law, you have to reverse an equation or manipulate it in some way, as add a coefficient and add them together. That's what we're doing here, except instead of delta H's and that sort of parameter, we're going to do it with equilibrium constants. If I reverse a balanced equation, that is, if I switch the products and reactants, I could write HCOOH is in equilibrium with CO2 and H2. Switch my perspective. What I did to switch the places in the products and reactants, what do I do to the equilibrium constant? Well, we can always write it out. <coughs> What if I wrote that? What would K be? It 
just be switched? Well, what do you mean by switched? Yeah, you basically, I, I would use the, the word inverse. Um, so I think you're thinking of the right thing, but yeah, you basically just flip in products and reactants, so you flip the equilibrium across them. Let's call it K flip, make something up. Sounds cool. Did I just say that sounds cool? Man, I am a parent. Ugh. CO2 and H2 are in equilibrium with formic acid. And multiply it by 2. Everybody gets a coefficient of 2. need to remember the other rules. I could say, well, whatever it is, I got the balance equation, products of reactants, coefficients as exponents. So, multiply that reaction by a coefficient and raise the equilibrium constant for that power. You remember it, you remember it, because the beauty of this is if you can write out the balance equation, you can always go back to products of reactants and say, ah, that's what that rule was. Got it. Questions so far, thoughts so far. Hello. So why did I choose to multiply that uh, equation by two, the coefficient of two? Um, I had to make a choice to make an example. Um, two is probably the most common one you're gonna have to do. I mean, you could multiply the whole reaction by three if that's what you need to do to get it to cancel. In that case, all the coefficients get multiplied by three, and then what do you do to the equilibrium constant? If you go three, 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 then you raise it to the third power. So two is the most common example, but whatever number it is, you can raise it. But to directly answer your question, I made a choice to make an example. Sometimes when you're doing Hess's law, sometimes even when you're not doing Hess's law, you gotta add equations to get some sort of overall, which we actually already did in rate determining step. Let's add this uh, equation here, 2H plus and iron, um, to our original equation. So CO2 aqueous plus hydrogen aqueous 
is in equilibrium with formic acid, aqueous. And to that, I will add protons, solid iron, uh, and then the products will be hydrogen <coughs> and iron 2 plus. Cancel anything? Uh, yeah, my overall equilibrium constant, or perhaps more succinctly, what's my approach? Products over reactants, coefficients as exponents. Again, I think all of these, no, iron is the solid, so I leave that one out. All my aqueous go in, but the solid iron does not. H plus has a coefficient of 2, so that gets an exponent of 2. So would you fix your overall, or do you still keep your iron in the overall? Say that again, please. Would you keep your iron in the overall? Even though when like the balanced equation? Yeah. yeah, so the question was, do you, since I leave iron out of the equilibrium constant, do I have the iron solid? Do I leave it in the balanced reaction? I do. Um, if I don't, then I don't have enough, then I don't have atom balance. I don't have iron on both sides. Yeah. Good question. Solids and liquids, you leave out of equilibrium constant, they have to stay in the balanced equation. So that's not balanced. What about gases? What about gases? Um, I will not give you one that mixes gases and aqueous. You certainly can. Um, if I give you one that's gases, they'll all be gases, and I'll give you concentrations rather than pressures. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the other way to do gases in it is in atmospheres. So if you run into it, do it in atmospheres. Because one atmosphere is like an activity of one, because that would be your pure. If you have pure oxygen, you need one atmosphere of oxygen. Atmospheres work. Table there. What, uh, we can do it the long way, where I write the equilibrium constant for the first reaction, write the equilibrium constant for the second reaction, and then figure out how to combine them to get the overall. Let's not do that, though, because that would take time. We don't have that kind of time. Maybe we do, but let's not spend it on that. This will give me K1, and this will give me K2. A overall equals K1 times K2. If I add the equations, I multiply the equilibrium constants. We will summarize this
I switch products and reactants, what do I do to the equilibrium constants? Constant. Inverse them? Yeah, take the inverse, exactly right. multiply the whole balanced equation by a coefficient. What do I do to the equilibrium constant? Yeah, I raise it to that power. Um, so this is related to Perla's question. She asked why I chose a coefficient of 2 and then squared it. If I chose a coefficient of 4, I would raise KEQ to the fourth power. Whatever it is becomes the exponent. And then last, but not least, if I add balanced equations, what do I do to them? Equilibrium constants? Multiply. Questions or thoughts so far? Yeah. So do I mean writing products over reactants? You, you can. In this case, usually what you do is multiply numbers. Um, so we haven't yet, in this um, setting, done a number for an equilibrium constant. That's what we're going to do next. Um, and that is by far more commonly what you will do. You'll have a number for K1 and a number for K2. And if you add the equations, you multiply those two numbers to get the K overall. And that is a perfect lead-in. Please try this. Wait, can you go back up to the page? Yeah. Please try that in a moment. Um, so get yourself set up with this as we go through it. All right, please give this a shot. I got two equations. Um, I have below, I've labeled it as the third equation, but give, let's call this the overall. This is very much like what an exam question would look like. Um, give this a whirl and flag me down if you have questions.
What am I going to have to do here? How am I going to get out of this jam? No, it's over. It's over? Yeah, I just give up now. It's over. Oh, just give up. Yeah. That's that's the way out of the jam? Yeah, obviously. I guess that's the one way out of a jam that will always work, right? Yeah. It's not I mean, it's not every a good every jam has a different, you know, it's not a good play, solution, but, it's a good but you can always quit. Let's not though. Yeah. Here. Maybe later, but not not right now. <laughs> Quitting about 22 minutes. Um we're, what do I have to do to combine those to get the overall? Yeah, I'll need to flip the first one. So I use the word flip, but switch the products and reactants is what I mean by that. Flip the first balanced equation. But then what do I have to do to the equilibrium constant? What's that? Now, so if you multiply by negative one, you get a negative equilibrium constant, and you can't have that because that would mean you had a negative concentration. So we don't want a negative equilibrium constant. We can take the inverse, though. One over k one, or k one to the negative one power, negative one power, negative first power, whatever you prefer. Then what am I going to do? I have flipped the first equation. Now they are aligned. Then I have to add them. Add them both? Yeah, exactly. Add them both. Add the flipped first one to the second one. Second equation, that is. What will I then do to the equilibrium constants? Yeah, multiply. Good. My flipped first one, so I have a 1 over a K1 times a K2. Well, hey, that's not that bad. One over 1.0 times 10 to the 5th times 1.4 times 10 to the 7th what do I get? yeah 140 or if you want to do sig figs 1.4 times 10 to the 2nd clear that I know what I'm talking about. Circle my answer now. Let's do my checklist. Did I answer the question? Yeah, because they asked me for the equilibrium constant for three. Do I have the right sig figs? Yes. Do I have the right units? Oh, hang on. We didn't talk about units yet for equilibrium constant. So far, I have no units. Well, what units were given to me for the first two equilibrium constants? No units. So at least on paper, it's okay, right? But let's conceptually, um, we'll just cut to the chase. Equilibrium constants have no units. You put everything in in molar, but it comes out with no units. And this is related to the fact that they're actually supposed to be known in activities which have no units. That's a discussion that goes a little bit longer than I want to do right now. Um, what you need to know functionally is that the equilibrium constant should have no units. Why did you flip the first equation? Why did I flip the first equation? Um, let's actually write that out because then it will cancel um, what I need to do. What I need to do? My words, words are failing me. <coughs> Must be Friday. Flip. So I'm going to flip this and write it down here. Um, and so the question was, am I trying to cross out as much as I can? I guess so. I mean, philosophically, it's more like, can I get them to add to the overall? Typically, the way you do that is to get at least something to cross out. So let's see what we do here. If I'm going to add these two, I have CO on both sides. That'll cancel. And then I combine my 2H2 with another H2, and that gets, oops, come on. 
that gets me to three. Now I think I add, yeah, now I should add to the overall. Most commonly there is something to cancel, but sometimes there's also like an, an additive. So I have an H2 and 2H2, now I have 3H2. If you see a question like this on a practice exam, if you're practicing for exam one, and you say to yourself, oh, I'd like to do a few more of these because I'd like to practice, what, what do you go look for? How do you find more? Oh. So yeah, you can look at the other practice exams and just sort of find one that looks the same. But I'm phrase it another way, how would I categorize this problem? How would I describe this? You go home and you call your grandmama, what you do every Friday afternoon, you say, Grandma Ma, you'll never guess what we did at Chem 111 today. And she'll say, what are you talking about? <laughs> but she'll continue on anyway and say, multiple equilibria, or combining multiple equilibria or something like that. And your grandma will say, that's not as weird. What do you bring me? I learned from my dad that you say yes when your grandma asks you to take some green beans on the trip. After that, you can decide whether to eat them or not. But you take the green beans. Came out of a can, but you still take the green beans. Okay, combining multiple equilibria. Yeah, so you use the three, the three types of operations that we talked about here. Um, and then you eat your green beans after that. Questions, thoughts, multiple equilibria. Why does this matter? Other than the fact that it could be on the exam because the American Chemical Society said it's supposed to be. Why does it matter? How many equilibria do you think are happening in you right now? A bunch. Some ridiculously large number. I wonder if anyone's ever actually answered that. Let's find out. A lot, and a lot of them are, are chained together, which is how nature does processes that don't want to go on their own. That's not a very good sentence, but um, it is how, in my view, nature gets the work done that doesn't happen in the absence of nature. to search for. Nah. Nah. All right. This is not going to answer the question. I'm going to ask Henrik, though, who teaches Bio 210 right before this. He'll know. Or he'll know where to look. Until next time. don't know. We'll try and find out. People will often ask me, can I get extra credit if I answer that? There's only one thing that I offer extra credit for in the entire course. It's in this chapter. Wait for it. I think we're going to do it next lecture. No one has yet earned that extra credit. I'm waiting for somebody. Let's talk about my favorite principle in chemistry. I don't know a thing about the Chatelier. I don't know if it was a man or a woman or French or Belgian or what. I don't know, but it has a great principle. I like it because it's very intuitive. It has nothing to do with chemistry. I mean, it does. It's applied to chemistry. But for me, this works in all of life. And the idea is this. A reaction will move towards equilibrium if kinetics allows it to. That's my phrase. <coughs> if the activation energy of the barrier you drew on your quiz today is sufficiently small, 
when kinetics allows you to feature convert reactants to products, you will. And you will eventually reach balance, which is sort of by definition of what state of state. The Chatelier's principle often uses the language of shifts in a reaction. Shifts to make more reactants. Shifts to make more products. Um, so if you would, please copy down reaction A and reaction B. And we will examine this table. framing of the table is this. Will I get more products, more reactants, or I don't know, if I do the following, if I add a reactant? And for each of these, you have to consider uh, a reaction that was already in balance. It was already balanced, I already had the appropriate amount of products and reactants. The equilibrium was dynamic, but I was balanced. I wasn't changing the amounts of products and reactants. Everything's in balance in my reaction. I'm at equilibrium, feeling good, feeling great, how are you? Okay. Now, Still good. Big one is suitable. Laughing how old I am. No. Everything's in balance. I have the appropriate amount of reactants, the appropriate amount of products. I screwed up. How do I do it? By adding a reactant. It's not balanced anymore. Now I have too much what? was balanced, but I added reactants. Uh. I have too much reactants. So I will shift to do what? Yeah, to make more products. To get rid of that reactant. Make more products. Reaction A, if I take, if I add N2O4 to that reaction, I will make more N2NO2. Oh, no. Oh, no. I had a reactant, I'd have too much now, and I have to get rid of some. I'll do that by making products. Bless you. What about reaction B? Nitrogen, N2, plus hydrogen is in equilibrium with ammonia and heat. This is probably the reaction that is done more than any other reaction in the entire world. It's how we make fertilizer. Petroleum. How we feed ourselves, for better or worse. If I had N2, the reaction that's at equilibrium, I now have too many reactants. What will happen? Yeah, make more products. Same idea. If I add hydrogen, I will also make more products. If you add either any reactant, you'll make more products. That's good if you want the products. Add more reactant, get more products. Hey, good. I like to think of heat as a chemical. It's not. But I like to think of it that way in a balanced reaction. Why? Because it allows me to address this. If I increase the temperature for reaction A, let's do reaction B first. If I increase the temperature for reaction B, which shift do I expect? Make more products, make more reactants, or I don't know. Reaction B, increase temperature. More reactants, why would you say that? Heat is a product. And if I'm increasing the temperature, I add heat. That's like adding a product. It is adding a product. Shift the reaction to make more reactants. Totally right. Yeah. 
Yes. About reaction A. Does it still make more reactants? Reaction A, I would say, I don't know, I don't have enough information. Unless you know where the heat is, you can't really know. Um, so it might, but I don't think we have enough information. If heat's not in there, you gotta ask, you gotta look it up. Or you don't know. Now increasing the volume. If I have reaction A, where there is one mole of gas in the reactant, two moles of gas in the product, and I have it in a sealed ampule, which is a good word in chemistry, it's a piece of glass that I've sealed with flame, it's totally sealed. So sealed again. Um, that has a certain volume. If I crack open the ampule and break it open to the atmosphere, I have drastically increased the volume. What does that gas do? It comes out, it expands. If I increase it, it will expand to create more moles of gas. Which side has more moles of gas? Products. And the way I determine that is to see if I increase the volume, I basically allow the thing to expand, like ideal gas law style. It will make more moles of gas. Whichever side has more moles, that's the side you If you do that to a liquid or a solid, what happens? If I take my um, aqueous equilibrium that's in a sealed flask, if I take my orange juice, which is that an acid has has an acid equilibrium in it, citric acid or whatever, and I dramatically open the bottle. What well, happens? Yeah, nothing happens. Um, now, if you have a carbonated beverage, you open the bottle. What happens? Hello. Yeah, you shift to make yeah, you shift to make more gas phase stuff. So it will affect dissolved gases, but if it's all aqueous or if it's liquids and solids, that um, in reality, not zero happens, but it's so small that. Yeah. So for volume, you're only looking at gases. Uh, what about reaction B? Which side has more moles of gas? Yeah, reactants, so I'll make more of those if I expand it. Whoop. This is a really good example of how else could Gels ask the question. So we do three parameters so far. Concentration of one of the chemicals in the balanced equation, temperature, heat, and volume. So I could do some combination of those. What else can I change versus what's here? The equations. So yeah, I can give you different equations. I can give you one where I ask about volume, but it only has aqueous and liquid. And you say, pop that change. Good. What else? Uh, adding a product. Exactly. I could, here I added a reactant. If I add a product, what happens? They make more reactants. You have to make more reactants, right. What if I remove a product? You have to remove a reactant? Well, yeah, I do. So if I remove a product, what does the reaction do? It shifts to replace it. It makes more products by removing, by using up the reactants. Remove a product, I make more. This is good if the product is something you want to make to sell because you're removing it anyway. And what does nature do for you? It makes more. Vermilion. Nature's the business. Sell product, make more product. Make more money, sell more product, make more product. Uh, what about the temperature and the heat? How could I change that? Decrease the temperature? Yeah, I could decrease the temperature, remove heat, and then still you're looking for, okay, let's consider heat a chemical, and you like pause. Let's consider heat a chemical. Did I add it or remove it? Okay, then I can figure out which way to shift. Uh, the other language you will see is if I make more products, I'm shifting to the right because products are written on the right. Kind of an awkward phrase, but it is what the community uses in the here. Shifting left is making more reactants.
Shadley is principal. It's a good one. Weekend, follow me so you get your stuff done session. E104 Chapman. Otherwise, have a good one. See you. Thank you.